You get essentially the polygon of open area around the robot. Right? This tells you the free space. The laser goes out, hits something, comes back, gives you, you can estimate distance from that. And then you spin the laser off of the mirror around about 10 times a second. And, when we, and from that polygon, we can essentially determine the open area, but also as the robot moves around, we can start to build out maps of the open space around the robot, right? And so this kind of control, this type of mapping, uh, is essentially what I teach in senior level robotics class. This is now a textbook. We know how to do this really well. Um, and so this is part of the area of, of localization and mapping for robots. But once you have this map, then you could say, all right, we know where the robot is, we know the map of the area, we can now click on a particular new location on the map, and the robot should, should go to that location. So in this case, the robot, uh, we told, we clicked on the location and say, robot, go back to the, to the, um, to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the lab, and now the robot is just navigating on its own back into the, into the lab space. Um, these methods are so good that I would, that I don't mind uh, trusting him to, to my kid, to, for my kids, so that's my son, he's, he's standing in front of the robot. If, that was, if I did not trust these systems, I would not let him do that, or my, two, my nephew who was two years old at the time. Uh, these systems are safe enough that I do not worry about kids near, near the robot when it's navigating. And these, are, these systems are, are good enough that now they can actually be, go, be tested on the road. So the same, uh, essentially the same methods for, for simultaneous localization mapping and, and autonomous navigation, that's what's driving, literally driving autonomous cars right now. Um, and so this is done by my colleagues, uh, Ryan Eustace and Ed Olson at, uh, at, um, at, uh, at, at Michigan. Uh, so they essentially have laser range finders that sit on top of the, of the car. These are 3D laser range finders, so instead of just, uh, just shooting lasers in the plane, it shoots them all over the place. And from that, you can actually get very good three-dimensional maps. And so this is, a, this is a map of Ann Arbor. Any football fans, if you like football, that's, a, that's essentially Michigan Stadium. Seats 115,000 people. Um, and, uh, and then you'll, you'll see Ann Arbor. Uh, so this is, this is a map of downtown Ann Arbor. So all of that is built directly from the car. Um, and then you can see in red what the, what, the, what, the, uh, what, the, what the car is currently seeing in terms of its laser range finding. And so these 3D maps are great. We are able to build these 3D maps now but your robot does not understand the difference between the building or the trees or other cars or pedestrians. Uh, actually, when you go through, when it goes to this uh, intersection, you'll, you'll, you can actually make out uh, bicyclists that are, coming, that are coming through the intersection. And so even though we have 3D data and it looks very interpretable to us, it is not very interpretable to, to the robot. We don't understand the semantics of these scenes. And this really is our next challenge to go beyond mapping to be able to understand the semantics and do semantic mapping. And so this gets us to really our, our next sensor, which is, the, which is the Connect camera, a 3D RGBD camera. And so this camera basically gives us a three-dimensional point cloud that allows us to, to grasp objects. So this is just manual teleoperation control. But what you're seeing in, in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in the monitor display is essentially a three-dimensional, uh, three-dimensional what we call a red, green, uh, color and depth point cloud that we get from the robot that's sitting from a connect on, on top of its head. From that, it's very easy for a human to pick out, all right, here's the sprite can and I need to put it on, I want to put it on the bowl or do something or do anything like that. To the robot, it's just a collection of points. And so usually what we do with these types of sensors is, uh, is we, we have a basic point cloud processing pipeline uh, that allows us to interpret the 3D. So if we go, if we go up to a table with a bunch of, bunch of objects on it, we can take a three-dimensional point cloud and then sort of move it around and, we can, and, and from this, our first step is really to estimate surface normals and then be able to cluster those into different types of objects. So in this case, uh, chrome core processing, uh, our standard pipeline, this is not, not necessarily us, but this is just the standard pipeline, is that for every point in our point cloud, we're gonna, com we're gonna compute the, uh, the, the nearest neighbors to that point. We're gonna center all those points and generate the principal components. Your smallest principal component is going to represent your surface normal. Your other, your larger two principal components are gonna represent the tangent plane that, that lies in the surface. So we're gonna be able to get surface normals and essentially a local approximation of the surface at every point in the point cloud using principal components. Once we do that, we're gonna cluster for the largest flat surface. So all those surface normals that are pointing in the same direction, we'll cluster those together, we'll figure out which is the largest flat surface and then anything, and, and we will cluster those together, and then any clusters that are sticking out of that flat surface, 
we're going to consider to be uh, to be um, to be a one one object that we can pick up. So if we see the result of this, uh, what we're going to get is we're going to get essentially these objects that are uh, that are sticking out of the point cloud and they're labeled in, in green. Um, and this is part of a just standard pipeline we get with our with our robot. And then for each, for any one of those clusters, we can say robot pick up that cluster with the right arm or pick this up with the left arm. And the robot can do it. And, but uh, but that only but that does not account for if there's objects that are stacked on top of each other, or objects that are touching, or objects that could be occluded. We only get just sort of the, just sort of the basics, right? This is this is usually step one. And that really is just gives us enough to pick up objects and go place them somewhere else. That doesn't give us a, uh, that doesn't give us enough robustness to consider all types of different types of scenes, different types of uh, of sources of uncertainty. It doesn't give us the ability to say, here's a goal, here's a task that I want you to do. And that gets us to our next step, where when we want to be able to delegate things, delegate tasks to robots, say, robot, go do this task for me. It's really what we what we're pursuing that as is, is being able to do goal directed autonomy. Give the robot a goal, and it'll figure everything else out. And so what we're really asking ourselves is, can we build a programmable world? Can we make our world programmable? And I would say the answer is yes, but the big things that we have to, have to address right now are perception and affordances. We need to be able to, our robots can't work if they can't see, and our robots really can't see very much right now, other than the largest flat surface. And so this is where we've been able to use neural networks. This is where we've been able to combine it with probabilistic inference to get, some, to get what we think is a good, a good foundation for doing this. If we want to start to do things beyond just pick in place, pick something up and go move it somewhere else, such as being able to open a door, being able to use a spray bottle, being able to, to load a dishwasher, you have to know something about the for, what actions each object affords. And that's a much harder problem, and that's really our future work. These two things are the key. So coming back, we want to be able to have our robots work in all sorts of environments to do all sorts of things, cooking, assembly, chores of activity, and chores of daily living, all of those things. And that requires us to see all these objects. Right now, a robot can see less than a fraction of a percent of the objects that are in these types of environments. And that, and that really prohibits us from doing all these other things. Because what we're really phrasing the problem as is, we want to be able to use any robot, X robot, to perform any task that we can demonstrate to it and be able to do it in any environment. That's, where, that's our goal. That's what we're trying to accomplish. And we're just taking the first steps in that direction. And so our approach to this is to do goal-directed manipulation. That is, let's say that a user comes in, specifies what goal theme, what goal theme could be I want, when I want the small object put in the bed, we can put a small language tag on that. That means I want you to put all these objects, these smaller objects in this bin, and take the larger block, block, box objects and put them over to the side. We can specify that. That's not a problem. The hard part is, if we wanted this to be generalized, we could have any number of initial scenes that we could start off with. They could be cluttered, they could be, things could be stacked in all sorts of different ways. But if we can perceive that initial scene, then we've got methods in place to be able to do the rest of this and achieve or realize an arbitrary goal. So the hard part of this is the realizing an initial scene. But if we can do that, then we can essentially achieve, we can essentially have the robot be able to do all the actions, reason over everything, in order to be able to, to accomplish the goal scene. And so this is some of our, our recent work. So this uh, recently appeared in, in, uh, in the International Journal of Robotics Research. And so, uh, so this is being, being able to have the robot just, I mean, it basically, we provided the method to perceive the scene initially, and the robot reasons over everything else. Right now, we're using symbolic reasoning systems with, uh, with configuration space motion planning, but it doesn't have to be that. There are any number of ways that we could, we could do this, and we're trying to be agnostic to that, because there, there's a big toolbox, and we want to have as many ideas in that as possible. And so this idea of goal-directed manipulation comes from the way that we do goal-directed navigation for your autonomous car. Pretty much every autonomous car has an, has, is a car that's situated in an environment. You have a probabilistic localization system or a GPS system and, then, uh, and that has some uncertainty around it. From that, you get a state estimate about where the car is and what the map is. Then that's given to a symbolic reasoning system for doing motion planning 
and motion control, and that produces the motor commands to the car to basically have it have it have the car drive itself. We're emulating this plan for this 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 approach for goal-directed manipulation. So right now, what we're doing is we're doing uh, probabilistic scene estimation from RGPD sensing. From that, we get a scene graph, which is our estimate of the poses and the objects in the scene. From that, we do task planning, motion planning, then uh, motor control, and that generates the commands for our robot. And so we're following the same paradigm, but what goes in each of those boxes does not necessarily have to be a search-based pattern. Scene estimation is the critical part here because our robots, again, our robots cannot work if they can't see. So in this case, we want to be able to do scene estimation and clutter in a way that's going to be general. And so we can't rely on necessarily green screens that you might see in, in a lot of robot videos. We have to move beyond the blocks world. We don't want to have isolated objects, so lots of computer vision is focused on the, the isolated Coke can on the tabletop. We need to be able to do better than that. And AR tags are great, but we can't expect AR tags to be all throughout our environments for everything that we want to see. Not at the resolution we're going to need. So we, we can't rely on these things. We want our environment to be as natural as possible. And so our problem is that we want to infer the scene graph, the poses of all the objects, which objects are in the scene, and then what are the relationships between our objects, which is which objects are, are physically supported by other objects. We're going to assume that we have object geometries, but we can, but those are things that we can get uh, a priori through user interaction. And this is to address, address the uncertainty that's due to physical interactions, due to occlusion, stacking, physical contact, and all, these, all the things that humans are, are very good at that, that uh, computer systems are bad at. And so our first attempts at doing this were to do what we call an axiomatic particle filter. So we have a probabilistic method that basically is able to, to break a scene into different parts uh, and then estimate the relationships. So in this case, we have two blocks that are stacked on top of each other, and then a toothpaste box in the, in the back. So we can have assertions, we can basically assert symbolic relations that say there's a table that exists, there's toothpaste on the table, there's a block on the table, and then there's another block on top of that second block. If we can get that particle filter, we can uh, infer that from a depth image, then we essentially can estimate our initial scene graph, which is the, the key here. If we have that scene graph and then give and then give that scene graph along with the goal scene to a planning system, so right now we're just using the baseline strips A star planner. We can essentially get a sequence of actions to execute. We can execute each of those actions through motion planning, and that plan is then given sent to, sent to the robot for it to execute. And that, that essentially is the process that I showed in the and the result of that is the process I showed in the, in the past video. Um, our axiomatic particle filter essentially treats uh, treats the state as a, as a latent variable uh, where we know the controls and, uh, and observations, but I just wanted to flash that up there so you can see that. Um, and this is, what, this is sort of the back end of what the process looks like. So if we have just three bots and they're stacked in a particular way, uh, we're essentially seeing an overlay of all potential hypotheses of a scene that could be given. And once it, once it uh, converges into something that is clear, we get our estimate of the scene. And then that generates a collection of actions. So in this case, all we want the robot to do is take the objects, move them over to the side, and stack them as neatly as it, as it can. And so this is done completely autonomously. In our next step, we're going to add a non-box object, uh, which is going to be a bin. So a bin has just an arbitrary geometry with a hole inside of it. Um, we're going to do the same process, so as everything becomes more clear, our distribution becomes more, more, um, more certain, and then, uh, then essentially we'll have a good state estimate for where all the objects are, and so you can see the bin, and you can see the three blocks. <coughs> and in this case, what we're going to do is have the robot be able to take the middle block in the stack and put it into the bin. So the robot will take the top block off, off the stack, put the middle block into the bin, and then stack the third block over to the side, nice and neat. So in our last example, what we have is the same, uh, what I showed in the beginning, the initial, the initial scene that we have here, that we have, and so really it's about seeing the convergence. So what you're seeing is the robot basically trying to reason over where do all these objects go that best fits the, the depth cloud that it's seeing. And so 
Once we have that convergence there, essentially what we have is a very good, it would have a reasonable estimate of, where, of how the scene is configured and where all the object poses are. One thing to note with this is that we have to re-estimate after taking each action because the world could have changed. Um, and we also get very good, very good estimates about what the, what, the, what the objects that are most visible. But the objects that are beneath those, that are occluded, we have some uncertainty on. You know, it could be in this pose, it could be in that pose. We can't see everything, but we're maintaining probability mass over those, over those areas. And so this video is essentially what I've shown you before, but it's showing the back end of that process. Ten minutes, all right. So I've already shown it to you, so I'll move on. And so one thing that I did was I, that, I was, that was tricky about, uh, about that past video that I showed you is that we knew all the objects in the scene. We knew that these objects were here, we just didn't know what their poses were and how they were configured. And, uh, and this is something that, you know, that my students, and I, my students and I have continual debates about should we be Bayesian all the way and have probabilities for everything? Should we be neural networks all the way? Deep, net, deep learning has, you know, my students are definitely, are definitely into the ideas. You know, they, we talk about it all the time. Should we do that all the way, right? And among all of these debates, really what came out of it was, maybe we should have a combined approach. Neural networks have been extremely good at doing object recognition from RGB. But we still need to maintain probability mass over er areas where where you know, if there was a false positive, if there was a there's a misrecognition, or you know, or maybe we didn't quite get the pose quite right. So what we're going to do is use neural networks to give us hypotheses over what objects are on the scene, and we use that within probabilistic inference as evidence in the probabilistic, probabilistic, probabilistic inference to give us ideas of where our probability mass should go. And so this is our, so our current work essentially. Uh, essentially does this in terms of doing in terms of doing manipulation and clutter. So our scene estimation methods essentially starts by taking objects in a cluttered scene, trained by a re recurrent neural network, um, and then uh, then that gives us candidates of where the objects could be. And so based on these candidate objects, uh, these bounding boxes, we start to enumerate possible scenes that could be out there. For each of those, then we have, a, we have essentially a particle filter-like optimization that tries to find where all, this, those, the, where all the objects are, eliminate the false positives, and then plan a graph for, that, for, for, where, for the object that we would like to manipulate. So in this case, what we're gonna do is, once we can, can determine that, we're gonna try and sort these objects into two bins. Uh, so one of those bins to the left is supposed to be laundry, and the other bin is supposed to be non-laundry. Um, I don't think my students really do laundry, so I don't think the classification is quite good. Uh, but, uh, but the basic idea is that we know, we, we, with, with these systems, in cluttered environments, we know which object we're picking up. We can pick it up relatively robustly. Even if we miss it, we can come back to it because we know which object we want to get. And we can do something purposeful with that, with that object. And so this really is the basis of, doing, of being able to do perception and manipulation. Um, And so these, you know, so I, I'm, so I, I just, uh, I, so the process was, was happening up in the corner. And so we can essentially do this, do this, do this robustly and reliably uh, over and over and over again. And so uh, this is just, so what happens, we just come, we dump stuff on the table, robot picks stuff up and sorts it. And, uh, and you know, and I'd say our accuracy with this uh, is, is above 90%. But I really started talking about learning from demonstration. And so what this is able to do is able to say, instead of th thinking of learning and demonstration as let me show the robot exactly what it should be doing in terms of a control trajectory, what we really want to show is the robot, this is what I want the scene to look like. And so when we think about this in terms of the learning from demonstration context, um, what we'd like to be able to do is just show the robot, uh, here, here's a goal scene, so let me come in, I'm gonna move objects around, so you, it's really small, you can't see it, but a user is coming in and then saying, you know, here, here's how I want you to construct objects on this, uh, on, this, on this tray. Then we can essentially estimate, we can det detect all the objects, estimate them, figure out what their, what their intended goal scene is. And once we have that goal scene, we can store that. Right now we store that as PDDL. And then at some future time later, for some arbitrary initial scene, 
we can estimate the, what that scene looks like. We can optimize over that uh, and then figure out here are the objects, here are the, here's the scene. And then once we have that scene, we store it as PDL. We have a symbolic search that goes and, and, uh, and um, essentially reasons over how the, what, 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 what should be performed. And then the, uh, the robot can then achieve that automatically. And what the game changer here really is that the user just shows you what, what the user just shows, this is what I want the world to look like. We're really programming the world in that, that extent. Um, this is just one more, this is just this, this one more video showing this in terms of neural, using the neural network. I'm gonna skip this for the sake of time. In the future, we wanna be able to do this not for just pick and place, but for general object affordances. So right now we're using something called the, the, uh, the affordance template uh, framework. So in the affordance template framework, you essentially uh, you actually essentially fit the geometry to particular objects, and then the robot, and then there's essentially a robot action associated with this. A lot of this is manually handcrafted. Anybody see the DARPA Robotics Challenge? There you go, DARPA Robotics Challenge. Essentially, almost every team had something like manipulation affordances, and they had a human user sitting in front of a large bank of uh, monitors to be able to operate the robots, it's essentially fitting affordances on top of point clouds. We should be able to do this automatically and autonomously and do it for all types of cluttered scenes. And so really, the notion of affordances, we're just now at the beginning of thinking about what this gonna, is gonna look like as a general formulation. I believe that affordances, in particular, is the area where neural networks will outperform uh, other approaches such as search or probabilistic inference, because this is so, because uh, this is really where you need data. Data and, and, um, and, and well-collected data and really great systems, uh, really great inference systems to do this, and I think that's, that's really important. And so, really, this is what 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 this is really what we're what we're, what we're looking like in terms of in terms of trajectory. We believe your I believe your robot will be here in three years. Maybe maybe I'm off on that. I think if you look at the election, you should know not to trust the polls. Um, but uh, but that's my that's my thought on it. Um, but really, what you should start to be asking yourself is, what is this going to look like? Suppose you have your robot and more. Will society be better? This is a big question. I have lots of thoughts on this that I'm gonna say that I'm gonna spare you from. But if you wanted to really do something, I believe there are areas where beyond autonomous driving and other areas where, where you can make a big difference and make and become rich and famous if you really wanted to. Healthcare is at the top of that list. Infrastructure, being able to repair our infrastructure and maintain it. Education.